I'm Christian Coates, and I'm the CEO of the First Amendment Museum, located in Augusta, Maine, where we help people understand and inspire people to exercise their First Amendment freedoms. Thank you for tuning in to the Five Freedoms Lecture Series, hosted jointly by James Madison's Montpelier, the Center for Civic Education, and the First Amendment Museum. Over the past two weeks, we've covered both freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. Today, we're joined by Gene Polosinski, former COO of the Museum, founding editor of USA Today, and First Amendment Museum board member to discuss the third freedom found in the First Amendment, the freedom of the press. Although the five freedoms found in the 45 words of the First Amendment are presented in an intentional order, they are all equally important. All of them are necessary to accomplish the goals and fulfill the purpose of the First Amendment. The freedom of the press only makes up four words of the First Amendment, and it's the third freedom listed. But a free press is absolutely essential to a democratic society. In fact, in Madison's initial wording of the First Amendment, I have to go there, it specified that the right to a free press shall be inviolable because it is one of the great bulwarks of liberty. It's a good thing he had an editor. <laughs> Indeed, the press has been called the fourth estate or the fourth branch of government because it provides a different kind of check on the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. The freedom of the press is especially important to the First Amendment Museum because the building our museum resides in was once home to Maine newspaper titan Guy Gannett. Gannett Publishing, later Gannett Communications, owned newspapers, radio stations, and TV networks throughout the state of Maine and across the nation over the span of the 20th century. A tireless champion of the free press, Guy Gannett once said, I've never regarded the newspaper as a piece of private property to be managed for mercenary ends, but rather as an institution to be managed for the public good and to be made a force in the community for the promotion of the welfare of our city, state, section, and nation. The free press enables people to disseminate ideas. We have the right to think whatever we want, thanks to the freedom of religion. We have the right to discuss those ideas, thanks to the freedom of speech. But to get our ideas into the minds of a larger audience, we need media publishers of all kinds who can help us get ideas, information, and of course the news into the hands of the people. Time and again, a free press has proved essential to expose corruption, like during the Watergate scandal, to advance human liberty, like William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator, and to speak hard truth to power, as the Boston Globe's Spotlight team did. The ability for all Americans to receive multiple viewpoints and opinions creates a society where we can think freely and actively partake in the marketplace of ideas. The free press allows us to join in the civic process in an informed and thoughtful way, which should result in better decision-making and a greater understanding of our world, the people in it, and the issues that surround all of us. But the world of the free press is fraught with danger in our 21st century society. Misinformation, disinformation, the death of local journalism, the death of paper journalism, the rise of algorithms, big money and big media, fake news, media bias, social media news, and foreign influence make up a short list of the controversies surrounding the American free press today. Trust in what has been dubbed the mainstream media is at a low point in our country's history. Even discerning what the legal definition of the press is in today's America is an ever-changing existential exercise. Fortunately for us, we have Gene Polosinski here tonight to help us get a greater understanding of the freedom of the press, its history, its nuances and complexities, and perhaps to parse out some of these trickier modern conundrums. So Gene, thanks so much for joining us tonight, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, it's, a, it's nice to be with all of you, even if it's virtual, and uh, hopefully we can go through this topic tonight. Uh, as Christian said, one of the more contentious issues in our country today, uh, but it's always been so, and it, that's something I'd like to, to emphasize. A couple of points that I wanted to uh, state out front, uh, 
a little bit more of my history as well. Uh, I started uh, long ago in uh, the late 1960s um, in local journalism in Indiana, uh, and then moved off to Washington, where I covered Congress in the White House, um, and then helped start USA Today, as Christian mentioned, as one of the founding editors, and um, was there through 1996 when I moved over to a foundation called the Freedom Forum to work on First Amendment issues, and then uh, some years, a couple of years ago, joined in, although I had been uh, following the First Amendment Museum for almost a decade, uh, have joined its board. And, um, I think we have makings of a great institution there. A couple of points about the free press. One, it's always been contentious. It's always been, um, I guess, uh, in the center of controversy, which sometimes happens when you are not taking sides or even when you particularly are taking sides, I suppose. But there's one point that is so often left out of the debate about a free press today, particularly. And that is that while the founders did distinguish between, as Christian said, freedom of speech and freedom of press, and they recognized the unique role that media of their era and this one would have, freedom of press belongs to all of us. So when we talk about press rights, when we talk about the press role, protecting the press, we're really talking about our ability to convey ideas to a larger audience. And I think Frankly, those who would oppose uh, press freedom, whether that was in the colonial period or today, often try to make the press into some sort of an elite institution separate and apart from the people. And in truth, it is there really to represent the people very often, uh, to be the people's representative. Christian mentioned the fourth estate. Um, we really are, I think, in terms of the uh, society that depends on, on those who had, have a role full time. Uh, if you will, to focus on news and issues and, and to have a perspective, to follow it, to give us the information we would gather if we could, or if we had time, or if we had the inclination to do so. So that role that, that Christian mentioned that the founders had in mind was really as a surrogate and representative of the people, although they also, again, saw the distinct role of watchdog, uh, first on government, but then later on society. And the ability of, uh, I think, the respect and protection of ability of journalists to, to be um, a very effective counterbalance uh, on the three branches of government. And then again, something that's often not talked about to also bring us the news of how our society is functioning, good and bad. I'm not talking about happy talk news, but I am talking about what's working well. Because again, uh, as that wonderful introduction said, it really is essential to a, uh, a representative government, to a, a government in which the governed are the ultimate authority. Uh, you cannot make informed decisions if you don't have information. So what we have today may be a system in the view of many that is broken, but I would distinguish between the journalism of today and the press freedom or the free press cause that we continue to have after 230 years. And uh, there are reasons sometimes to distinguish between the two. I, I wanted to give a, a quick trip through history, if I can, um, about how we got to where we are, because I think that's very important in terms of setting out the assumptions we've had carried through in much of our history, uh, but also recognizing that, again, it's always been a contentious circumstance. You know, I, I start with the inspiration for the founders of all five freedoms, but essentially press and petition, which by the way, the founders saw a petition as the most important freedom. It would, speaking truth to power, would protect all the other freedoms. Some people variously will say it's the right of freedom of religion or conscience to think freely that protects the others. Some will say speech, um, but I, and, and again, the founders said petition. Uh, I think a free press is, um, so interwoven into the concept of how our government functions, how we know how our government functions, that uh, it is one of those core elements of how we, we retain our democracy, protect it, extend it, and make it work. Magna Carta 1215, uh, basically uh, a group of barons, relatively small, 25-ish, cut a deal with the king. Uh, it's largely a had to do with taxation and things, but it, it did allow them to, in, in the great phrase, speak truth to power. Now, it didn't last very long. The Pope basically threw it out 
as soon as he heard about it. Uh, but it did set the tenor for that sort of independence, if you will, from the divine right of the king. Um, charge forward to Gutenberg and the printing press in 1439, and you begin to see the spread of information. Well, again, a consistent theme through really almost any government that you can name up into modern times is that when information is disseminated, when it spreads, there's a desire by those in power to control that information. So you get, oh, I don't know, somewhere around 100 years, at least in the English world, um, before people try, Parliament, the King, try to restrain by licensing printing, licensing printing press. Um, in 1643, there's actually the codification of that. It's called the Printing Ordinance. And a year later, one of the great fundamental documents uh, for our founders that had to do with speech, religion, John Milton, uh, the English poet's Aeropagetica. And there's a, a great line in that again, which I think was such a core principle that we carry it forward today in something we call the marketplace of ideas, but uh, it has bearing on, on how a free press should function. And that is uh, his defense of um, essentially allowing anyone to set up a stand in the marketplace of ideas. Um, his theory was that truth would emerge. And I'm going to turn to a little sticky note because I never can quote this accurately, but I, for tonight I thought I should. At one point, Milton argues in Aeropagetica, which was essentially a treatise against this licensing, this attempt to control the press. Let truth and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth put to the worse in free and open encounter. Think about that for a second. What he's really saying is that if the crown or any level of government stays out of the way of a free press and the free press does its job of presenting all sides of the argument, if you will, all letting all the people set up a stand in, in the marketplace of ideas, truth will ultimately emerge. It's a tremendous optimistic statement. And you can see how that inspired the founders along with obviously a lot of other intellectuals and writings to have this great confidence that an unfettered press would be an essential part of democracy and uh, really allow us to function. Um, a couple more battles in Britain over licensing acts, but we enter the 1700s and approach the mid-century there um, with a couple of fundamental ideas. The press in Britain is free to discuss issues if not criticize the crown directly. 1735, I think it was, 34, uh, an editor in the United States, a printer, John Peter Zenger, prints some nasty stuff about the governor and who doesn't like it gets sued for um, defamation, libel. Curious thing about the English concept of libel at the time, um, you couldn't use truth as a defense because if it was a falsehood told about someone in power, um, well, if it was false, theoretically, it could be disproven. What made it even worse was if it was true, because then the person in power couldn't disprove it on the basis of it being false. Essentially, the system was tilted so that there was no, to be no criticism of those in power if they wanted to pursue defamation charge. Um, because if you lied, well, you defamed and a liar. If you defamed with truth, well, that was even worse. So Zenger's trial in which he was represented by a lawyer named Alexander Hamilton, but not the one in the play in the week, um, really set forth over across a couple of juries that were deadlocked on the issue of this idea of truth as an absolute defense. And that's really where the American unique concept of defamation began to, to emerge. You know, obviously there was no America yet. Um, we had this, again, I think stunning idea that if a free press or any individual, you or I, wrote something that was true, even if it defamed somebody in, in power, um, the defense of truth was adequate to protect us. A revolutionary idea. And again, one that's fundamental to me the function of a, a free press. Um, the newspapers of their era, and I think by the time of the Revolutionary War, if I remember right, there are 37 active uh, newspapers in circulation. Uh, much more journals of opinion, although uh, there were some, uh, frankly, resemble uh, issues, items that resembled uh, today's press. I believe on 
page two of Zenger's publication, um, there was a, a very scandal, a story about the scandal involving the King of France with some fairly, for that era, graphic uh, terminology. So um, that sort of thing has always been with us, I guess, in the press. Um, but as we approach the Declaration of Independence, as we approach the Revolutionary War, states are beginning to determine and state in their, and, and immediately following the, the, um, the war, um, their concepts of a free press. And as Kristen, I guess, mentioned, uh, the, this idea of Madisonian idea of it being a bulwark of defense. It's interesting in a couple of states, not all the states had that sort of open declaration about freedom of the press, but a number of states did. And some tied it to things like a free press and a trial by jury were essential. Um, so it's interesting that they saw these fundamental freedoms in that way and saw a free press as so intrinsic to the, the freedoms that they wanted to protect for human beings, the inalienable rights <clears throat> that was very often mentioned. Um, the English uh, legal scholar Blackstone in Britain uh, talks about the liberty of the press uh, comes about in having no previous restraints on publication. So no prior restraints, which is a theme again through the United States history. And, um, but also lays down a fundamental issue about no freedom from being prosecuted later for criminal acts, which comes into play even as things like the Pentagon Papers, and even today with national security documents that are being published. Uh, he said something on the order about if it's improper, mischievous, or illegal, printers have to be take the consequences of their own temerity. Um, again, an argument being advanced today. So we set up the five freedoms. Uh, in the First Amendment, part of the first uh, 10 amendments to the Constitution. You know, we cut a deal basically to get the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Uh, uh, very quick uh, lightning round on, on that area. Uh, we have the Articles of Confederation, 13 separate little entities, not functioning, push for a Constitution. Push back from some people saying, wait a minute, we just fought a war to get rid of a strong central government. Do we want another one? But clearly that was gonna happen to, for the country to survive. What happens? Well, these states again have some have declaration of right, human rights or declarations of rights. Um, and so the people pushing the constitution uh, push the idea that you get a constitution, those of you in favor of a strong central government, if we get a bill of rights uh, to protect the core freedoms we think are essential. Uh, so you get power and authority, I should say, to act on one side, restraint, uh, and protecting the people on the other side. So between seven, uh, 1787 and 1791, when the Bill of Rights is adopted, uh, frankly, we just cut a deal. We had a, a negotiation among ourselves as a nation and we got the Bill of Rights. Um, but again, government has to me um, very often a tendency to want to control and limit, very often with stated good intentions. Seven years after we get press freedom, Along comes the Sedition Act, 1798. It says that you can't criticize the president or Congress. Uh, there was a fear of war and uh, they used that to justify it. Over the first few years, um, somewhere around 18 editors were arrested. Um, it's not a great success, frankly. It doesn't stop the criticism, obviously. And that's another lesson about press censorship is it rarely will stop what you're trying to censor. It just drives it underground. Uh, the editors are jailed. Uh, again, it's unpopular. One of them even runs for public office and is elected out of jail. Anyway, it lasts uh, a couple of years. Uh, Adams is out. Jefferson is in. Uh, Jefferson, well, the act is allowed to expire, I think, in 1801. And Jefferson pardons all the editors who were convicted. So for some people, you know, how distressing, just seven years after the Bill of Rights, we have it. There's another view, contrarian view, advanced by some of my colleagues and myself that it was actually, pardon the expression, sort of like an inoculation or a vaccine. The country went through very early in its history, this massive intrusion on press freedom and found didn't work, didn't like it, was viewed as unjust, better off without it. And I think that set a tone again in our country that lasted, has lasted a long time. That the press needs to be free, even though they're disappointing at times, they're certainly opinionated, uh, they may or may not doing, be doing what you want them to do, but they were better off with an un unrestrained, unfettered press for the reasons we've talked about, this washed up in government, and, and a place for us to express our own views. Um, we have some other attempts to regulate the press and us in terms of what we might write. Uh, 
So the idea of seditious libel, which is that basically not only could you be sued for defamation, but that you could be jailed for it. Um, there's a number of states, I think something like 16 or 17, still have such acts on the book, but books, but courts have basically said criminal libel does, does not you know, function well at all. And they, you can't, it's just not an active body of law. Um, so we, we see the nation going from an agrarian nation into a, a more of a citified, if you will. Uh, technology is advancing. We have railroads, we have the telegraph. We see the rise of the Associated Press, um, which is um, cooperative uh, newspapers around the country using the telegraph principally, but also written dispatches to communicate news nationwide. Obviously, a free press is part and parcel of what led up to and during the Civil War in terms of those favoring abolition, favoring the war, those opposed to it. Um, Lincoln, the great president, um, obviously uh, known for a lot of his um, achievements in terms of, of uh, leading the country through the Civil War, of being this champion of liberty. When it came to the press, eh, not so fast. Uh, he was particularly threatened by editors called copyheads in, in Boston in particular. So um, he, uh, he shut down a few papers and reconsidered them very, fairly quickly, I think under, under again, this idea that you, you, know, you cannot censor the press, you cannot shut the press down. And a couple of generals threatened to arrest, I think the editors of the Chicago Tribune. Um, but we saw this tremendous advancement in how a free press could impact the nation. Uh, we began to see, again, mass circulation dailies in larger cities uh, for their time, the, the rise of lithographs, um, apart from daily newspapering, uh, photographs, uh, which brought home the horrors of the Civil War in a way that uh, people um, seeing displays of photos or dioramas had never seen before. Uh, and uh, obviously, tremendous casualties in the Civil War. Uh, horrific casualties, and it, it affected the, how the tenor of the nation and how they felt about the war. Um, this trend con continued after the Civil War to growing a free press. You began to see the rise of moguls, uh, Hearst and Pulitzer, latter half of the 1800s. Um, cities became, I mean, villages became cities, which then uh, allowed the penny press to, to rise the, the idea of uh, both the press as a representative and as a sensational enterprise. Um, you know, whether or not William Randolph Hearst actually uh, you know, sent the telegram about uh, in terms of war with Spain, you know, you, you send me the stories and I'll, I'll give you the war kind of a quote, um, apocryphal, but no question that it was powerful in terms of being an instrument of leading public opinion at that point. But, this is where that concept of watchdog on government moved from, I would, I would argue, from being a journal of opinion, which is early colonial newspapers and on into the 1830s and 40s, even the Civil War election period. Very often those were influenced owned by um, opponents of each other. Um, there's a, um, you know, I think a sense that somehow, um, you know, it was all powdered wigs and harpsichord music and after you, very polite, no. Uh, the language of the early press um, from the colonial period to the Jacksonian period and up to the Civil War, um, I like to say would probably drive the average politician today to, to hide in the basement calling out for mom. Uh, there's a, a great story, um, a play that was based on, on letters um, between the, uh, Abigail and John Adams and, and others. And um, the play recounts a moment when Abigail is, uh, John are apparently sitting at the breakfast table and Abigail is reading that week's newspaper, most of them being weekly. And, and in the play he says to John, oh, look, John, this editor who was known to be associated with uh, Jefferson has called you a royal, uh, royalist syphilitic bastard. And pause, and she says, all in all, not a bad addition. Uh, so, I mean, it gives you the tenor of the criticism that might have been circulated in that period. Uh, Lincoln, clear, often compared to animals, to baboons, uh, you know, they, they didn't spare the criticism in those days. Today's debates um, can be rancorous and, as they say, robust, but uh, trust me, they were every bit that um, in the press of that era. Just before we leave that 
sort of post 19 or pre 1900 era, think about the stresses on particularly the founders with this highly critical press. And yet they recognize this, this important role of the press in their minds going all the way again back to the theory in Magna Carta and their apogetica and other writers, their own experiences in the colony of being a voice for the people, of being that source of information and ideas flowing out from the people, but also keeping an eye on government, criticizing government, conveying that function of government to the people uh, from an unbiased source, uh, perhaps even a biased source, but certainly an independent source. Um, and again, that set the tenor for the American view of a free press, and I think is why we have such strong protection for a free press, even in an era in many areas in which it is, areas which it has not been popular. Um, Pre-World War I, one of the things that I wanted to note today is the rise of the muckrakers. Uh, they're sometimes working hand in hand with Theodore Roosevelt, uh, but people exposing ills from up in Sinclair and uh, those who would look at the quality of food and of medicine, um, looking at the um, excesses, uh, journalist Ida Tarbell writing in, in uh, uh, McClure's magazine. Magazines began to rise in that period. Uh, writing about Rockefeller's uh, Standard Oil Company, the trusts, um, an essential part of the trust busting part of that era. Certainly, again, it took laws to bust the trust, but it was the muckrakers who brought those to the attention and provided the public pressure on politicians uh, who, uh, who were those in the early days of looking out what I call consumerism and looking out for, for those. Uh, we get to World War I. Um, Wilson, again, making the world safe democracy, if you will, by Amer when America enters the war. Wilson himself pushed for heavy censorship of the press. Um, again, not something that is really part of his public record in many ways, but all too true. He was actually restrained by people in Congress and even some of his supporters, because I think he would literally have put a government censor in every newsroom. Um, but he recognized the, the, the ability to shape opinion. So he also began some of the earliest propaganda, some of the posters and stories that we uh, can recount of that era um, coming, came out of this early propaganda effort. Um, we, we saw at the same time, one of the great threats to, I think all the freedoms in the first amendment, but certainly to a free press, which is fear. Uh, I think there was fear of, of well, watching uh, the czarist regime in Russia tumble to communism, the rise of socialism uh, and uh, combined with industrialization in the United States, the um, tremendous surge in immigration. Uh, we saw a number of uh, trials, deportations, whatever around the uh, people who would speak out, use the press and pamphleteering. Again, we, we tend to talk about it and I tend to do it because of my background about newspapers. But remember, freedom of the press is, covers many, many mediums. And in those days, pamphlets, uh, posters, other means of getting the word out were, were certainly in the absence of, of broadcasters uh, up until the 20s, uh, were a principal way of getting a, a shaping opinion. And we saw regulations and again, prosecutions of people for pamphleteering. Uh, we, we see the first court decisions that talk about uh, protecting freedom of the press directly um, and uh, limitations. Uh, again, freedom of the press as a, uh, an item to be defended uh, has gone through some iterations. Generally, it's an incremental process. Uh, we get to World War II, uh, and we've gone through an era in which, uh, contrary to today's claims, uh, the press was seen as the province of conservatives, controlled by conservative publishers and owners. Um, liberals often did not find comfort in what was being written or in the later broadcast. Uh, you saw the rise of first radio as this incredible tool to inform the public. Um, and you began to see uh, the rise of what I would call star journalism, if you will, uh, where certain people were, were really the voice of the people in many ways or voice of the network. Um, will Rogers uh, uh, was one of the first. Um, and we see this tremendous communication tool suddenly coming into uh, people's homes in a unique way. Obviously, newspapers at that time in the 30s had been delivered uh, in terms of mass circulation 
um, for 40, 45 years. Um, but we, um, and you could, photography is introduced um, and there are issues about privacy that are raised by that. You know, the, the treatise in 1891 by future Justice Brandeis and a law partner talked about privacy and they saw two great threats to privacy, uh, which I really uh, love now to think about, but it, it does give me hope for dealing with privacy issues in this era that we've dealt with those in that era. One was the telephone, which as I believe Brandeis wrote, uh, unlike a proper gentleman does not knock upon the door and introduce themselves, but rings unbidden in one's household. So that was a tremendous invasion of privacy. And then you had the ability of what we, we would consider mass mainstream media, mass circulation daily, to print your image when photography uh, entered the printing sphere, newspapers with the Rotary Press. Uh, think about that for a second. Up until that time in the history of mankind, essentially your image was known to only those people immediately around you, with the exception of very rich people who might have had a drawing or a painting on a wall or a painting that would be hung in a gallery. <clears throat> you know, that was it. And suddenly, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people could see your image. And it, it was sort of at war with this idea of, of privacy, uh, the American concept of being able to you know, move 100 miles away and, and start over. No one knew who you were kind of thing. Um, so we, again, see newspapers at issue in terms of a, an issue around privacy of that era. Well, you, again, you, you come back out into the advances in movies, but principally um, in radio, bringing news and a sense of immediacy. Um, you know, people would, uh, in the early days of radio, uh, these huge trucks, um, if anybody of you remember a bread truck, that size van, big camper van, maybe thing loaded with equipment, tying into a phone line somewhere to do remotes. Um, we began to hear the broadcast, news broadcasts, first replicated and then live from sporting events. Uh, Somewhere I'd like to find the person, I think it was a Rutgers game where they actually sold the rights to the, to the game for the first time and set up that horrible system under which we, um, and now one broadcaster has the rights to an event, um, but too many push back on that. But you begin to see this and it begins to become part and parcel of American life. Um, and again, I, I'm actually uh, in the process of, of editing what I think will be an ebook about our transition in terms of a free press. Uh, and I call it from the village green to the village screen. So you can see that what I'm getting. Broadcast comes in sort of technologically anyway in the middle of that process. Uh, and we see this rise of radio, which brings immediacy. You know, the, the, the sense that uh, you can hear it now, which was a program, later see it now on television. Um, but you watch the rise of networks, the rise of national news operations. Um, and you get a sense for a period of time in America of what we call the news campfire, sitting around the evening, uh, around a mass medium, uh, even if it's divided up into various networks, hearing essentially uh, a certain set of facts about uh, an event um, with you know, relatively minor differences in many cases, not always. Um, and it created the ability for us to have, an, in effect, a national conversation, uh, which I think today is lost in the splintered aspect of how news is delivered. Uh, it's not really the function of a free press to have that, but it was something that the nation either enjoyed or endured, depending on your point of view, for a long period of time, um, 50, 60, 70 years, in which there was this um, sort of agreement of what went on, if you will, and, uh, and then an ability to see it and hear it. Uh, first hear it and then see it for yourselves. Um, and we began to be concerned uh, in, in the war about what news we were getting. You know, the press, with very few exceptions, um, was a willing uh, participant in wartime censorship as it had been in World War I, but in World War II, formalized. Uh, war correspondents wore uniforms. Um, and they were subject to great um, uh, censorship in advance. Although, again, we, we got, in many ways, uh, a clear function uh, of the press to report back what was happening. Um, but again, we, we learned later that many things were suppressed or not covered. Um, certainly uh, many newspapers, including the New York Times, knew of the horrors of the Holocaust for a number of years uh, prior to them really becoming uh, known in this country and the world so widely toward the end of World War II. Uh, 
Um, and I think it's one of the great mysteries for me, although people have written about it, um, what would have possessed people not to be reporting that. Although again, there were reports. Um, so it's not particularly, um, no such uh, circumstances with no one did the reporting, but certainly it was not reported in the depth um, that we uh, would have expected perhaps in today's culture. Immediately after the war, there's a recognition by those publishers and editors looking at the rise of technology, television, and uh, the, uh, the post-war era uh, that uh, what we've had, whether it was sensational tabloids or uh, conservative dominated uh, news outlets in the country isn't cutting it with the American people. Uh, there are larger stories to tell. Uh, and so something called the Hutchins Commission is formed. Henry Lewis of Time and the president of the University of Chicago, Mr. Hutchins, President Hutchins, have a commission. And they come out with recommendations, uh, which led to the introduction of a number of things. The op-ed pages in many newspapers grew out of that. And the issue, again, of accountability journalism, which I think was a return to that watchdog role um, of government, which was never lost. We returned to the era of the muckrakers of holding people accountable. That really carried newspapers forward from the late 40s, early 50s on in terms of the function of a newspaper. And it was picked up by particularly television broadcasters, if you will. Think about the rise of a free press in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the impact of television. A uh, huge uh, uh, sea change in the way Americans receive their news very quickly. Network television became the predominant way that uh, we received the news out from a free press. Uh, you begin to see the uh, dominance of a print press, uh, not so much an influence in the 1950s and 60s, but the, the economic dominance, if you will, uh, beginning to fade. You watch a lot of metropolitan newspapers, cities that had, New York had you know, a couple dozen daily. They begin to consolidate, there are strikes, financial issues begin to hit in that era, although newspapers remained incredibly profitable well into the 90s. Clearly, the rise of the television documentary, if you will. Uh, and we're watching protections for a free press rise in this era. Um, the civil rights movement as it was, and is for this country, uh, was for a free press, very much of a uh, sort of tipping point, if you will. Uh, and particularly in terms of legal protections. Um, we have a case in the 1960s, uh, which you'll hear about later and is in the news and will be in the news. I think in the coming Supreme Court term, if not this one, the one after, Times v. Sullivan. Uh, what happens, interestingly, and it's interesting that it is also not in any news report, but an advertisement in which uh, a number of Hollywood personalities who are active in the civil rights movement, coupled with local ministers and others um, in Alabama, publish uh, an advertisement which makes claims about how a commissioner, Sullivan, uh, in this uh, in this town, um, operated the police department. There, the city uh, departments were divided up in authority among three commissioners. Sullivan had uh, the police department. Interesting, I think the street department, the garbage department. But anyway, he had the police department. I mean, there are errors in that ad. Uh, Sullivan, uh, encouraged by a number of, of uh, frankly, anti-civil uh, rights racist figures, decides to sue the New York Times, the celebrities, and these local figures. Um, it moves through uh, the local courts, the state courts. Uh, Sullivan wins. Uh, the celebrities are dropped out. They essentially just provided money and they were able to drop out. So you have left the local folks in the New York Times. Um, it reach, eventually reaches the Supreme Court. Um, and a couple of things that I want to give you as background. Uh, one thing that's often left out of the recounting of Times v. Sullivan, which is seen as a press win. I think it's a win for all of us, but a press win. Uh, is the fact that when the Georgia Supreme Court decided to uphold the original court's decision, the Times and others appealed to the Supreme Court. But at that moment, because the state court held, the Supreme Court held it, the penalties were enforced against those. Um, and so what happened to the ministers, to happen to others, was that they lost cars, some lost homes. They paid a tremendous price. In many cases, they were not able to get fully compensated later when the case was, as you made you know, reversed by the Supreme Court. We, uh, while I was at the First Amendment Center of the Freedom Forum, um, we did a program there and we were able to get 
uh, one of the lawyers for um, one of the defendants, one of the local ministers, and uh, the lawyer who had represented Commissioner Sullivan uh, for a, a conference. And um, I will tell you that they would not talk to each other, and this would have been 50 years later. Um, they, they were still very bitter about it. Um, the lawyer for Commissioner Sullivan uh, did tell a, a humorous story. He uh, had a press conference apparently at the airport where um, he headed to Washington to argue the case and told uh, the local news outlets that the only way he would lose that case was that the Supreme Court of the United States overturned the entire history of defamation law in America. Um, well, they didn't quite do that, but when he got back home, he apparently had a press conference and he stood up in front of them and said, uh, they did. Uh, now that's not quite accurate, but it, was, it makes a good story, but they came close in the sense that what they did was give something. And again, today, Times v. Sullivan is so often portrayed as a freedom of press case and by its critics as protecting journalists. No, no, it protects all of us. What the decision from the court said was that lacking actual malice, which is not whether you're really mad, it was either a reckless disregard for the truth or deliberate distortion. Absent that, first for public officials and later for public figures, and later even for those thrust into being a public figure inadvertently, being involved in an automobile accident, um, that the bar for successfully claiming defamation damages was set very high in order to protect the free and robust debate that's necessary in democracy. So think about that for a moment. What that does is to say that the errors in that ad were not done deliberately. They were not done with a complete indifference to the truth. They were what you and I would call in ordinary terms an honest mistake. That that play between the joints of discussion in a democratic society has to exist, or essentially the potential to be sued for defamation for one minor error and perhaps a long discussion would chill that open debate that's so necessary in a free press. And by extension, when we speak, when we write a letter to the editor, when we might uh, be on the telephone talking to someone or speaking to a group, let's say, the American Legion, and you make a speech and you defame someone by saying something bad about them, but you have that defense of truth, which had been established in American law, and you have this protection from being sued successfully, and you can sue for anybody for anything, being sued successfully for an inadvertent, what I would call, again, not legal terms, an inadvertent error not done with a reckless disregard for the truth. So that standard is really what's under attack today. And I, I know that the people who would love to change that law, including now appears Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas, see it as a press or maybe even broader social media responsibility. But making it possible easier to be sued for, a, again, not to use a legal term, but an honest mistake, I think harms all of our abilities to use the right of a free press to discuss issues of importance to the public. So uh, you know, we have some other decisions that will bring us up to date. Uh, we have the Pentagon Papers, 1971. Um, again, you're gonna hear echoes of that earlier concept in Great Britain, well, England. Pentagon Papers were, um, as you may recall, historical, largely historical documents, but they were classified top secret, leaked by Daniel Ellsberg, the history of how the US got involved in, in, in its actions in the Vietnam War. Um, the Supreme Court was asked by the administration to block that, to restrain the publication of those, actually a couple of reports had already been published. Um, but the court held, again, that there is, under the First Amendment, no prior restraint of the press. It was hailed as a tremendous press victory. I think I remember seeing a cartoon um, of the Attorney General in armor uh, holding the sword, it's sort of drooping down and there's a, a, a quill pen stuck right through the armor uh, talking about the power of that decision. 
What is not so often remembered is that the justices, even those who agreed with no prior restraint, said, uh huh, but you know, after, if this is shown to have caused illegal harm to the United States, there may be the potential here for prosecution. And a lot of journalists remember the first part, but don't remember that second limitation on free press. So uh, you take that and um, something I, I should mention that is the legacy of uh, World War I, the Sedition Act, which was an attempt to, uh, well, not an attempt, it did criminalize the possession and dissemination of secret information. Uh, combined in modern era in a unique way, and I'll talk about that. Um, student press rights, I want to touch on that just briefly, just because there's such a sharp distinction in what happened in 1969, a young woman named Mary Beth Tinker in Iowa, uh, and her, I think a brother, a sister, and a friend, uh, they were part of a family uh, network that was distressed about deaths in the Vietnam War on all sides. And they decided to wear a black armband to school in Des Moines. Uh, and uh, the principal told them, remove it, remove it, or go home, and they refused to. Anyway, it gets to the Supreme Court. And there's this wonderful decision uh, in 1969, Tinker, which says that students, and by the way, teachers, for those of you who might be teachers in the audience, um, do not leave your rights at the schoolhouse door. Uh, but of course, we, that was in 1969. We've now spent every year after that time being afraid of students speaking their mind in print or in, in new media. Um, so we have decisions limiting uh, Tinker all the way up to it, including uh, a recognition of certain limitations uh, in what was called the, what, the cussing cheerleader case last last year, um, but uh, student press rights um, are an important element, I think, of preparing young people. Uh, you know, we we don't educate well about the First Amendment broadly, frankly, in our schools. Haven't since the 1950s, and um, you know, we sort of, I guess, assume that upon their 18th birthday, uh, the heavens open light streams down, you suddenly go, oh, I get it about the First Amendment or the Bill of Rights for the government. Uh, I think if it's not practiced in schools, uh, we have, and we know from surveys, we have adults ill-prepared to protect freedom of the press and the other freedoms in, in the First Amendment. Um, if, you, if you, and I'm skipping over, forgive me, but in the interest of time, um, essentially what we have today is a press with very robust protections. Uh, but we have um, a press which is under assault in a number of ways. Uh, with the rise of the internet, the sort of uh, double financial uh, tool that the press used, uh, commercial press used to support itself, um, is you know, disappeared about as close to it as you're going to get. Advertising supported really the construction of the newspaper, if you will, all the way to the loading dock and circulation, which Publishers were truthful, paid for getting it from the loading dock to your house, and that's all it did. Uh, incredibly cheap, uh, frankly, for what you got. Um, those, both those models have been obliterated in many ways by the, um, by the internet, although uh, publishers are uh, printed products today, which is, includes their online offshoots, are making a valiant effort to recapture some of their advertising and revenue. Television stations, radio stations are taking a hit. We've seen the demise of a free press, not from the dictator riding down the middle of Main Street in a tank, but from the fading in inability to really pay for the enterprise. And so we've seen the rise of news deserts in America, where a free press wasn't legally restrained, but simply no longer exists. There are simply no dailies or weeklies, no radio stations, and certainly no television stations existing in those vast swaths of this country, particularly in rural areas. But uh, we've seen the ability of mid-sized journalism, free press, um, to function because uh, they're big enough to have a lot of high expenses, but uh, not so big, Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, where uh, just on the basis of scale and huge audiences in a compact space, can they still support themselves with both good journalism, but also uh, an attractive place for marketers uh, worldwide. Uh, I think we've seen as the uh, attacks on a free press in the United States have uh, amplif been amplified and grown. We've seen a rollback of press freedoms around the world. 
uh, Freedom House, which is a nonprofit, not the one I, that's the Freedom Forum I used to be with. Uh, Freedom House uh, tracked um, press freedom for a number of years and I think their last report in 2017 before they moved on to just tracking uh, social media. 13% uh, of the world's population enjoyed a free press. If you pull out, frankly, Western Europe, the United States, Canada, from that, it is an incredibly dismal picture of press freedom around the globe. Why? That watchdog on government function is something that despots terribly fear and wish to do away with. And they have found ways to restrain it, uh, sometimes outright arrests, uh, you know, um, shutting down enterprises, but also at times using the so-called rule of law, lessening libel statutes to where government figures can sue newspapers for or, or new press publications, uh, free press for vast sums of money, one negative decision, bang, they're out of business. So the tools are, are, uh, are out there. And again, what fears, what I fear in this country is the echo of, you know, they saw us, the beacon of press freedom, beginning to lose confidence as a people, watching civic leaders from a number of points of view attack a free press. And, um, and then the complications brought about by new technology and social media, the blurring as Christians, I think, opened up with, but who is a journalist today? Uh, all of that has contributed to a weakened press. That echo effect is bouncing back outside the US, weakening your support for a free press there. So um, I think we're, we're at the point where um, I'd be glad to take questions. Uh, you know, there are issues around shield laws, um, confidential sources, uh, which maybe we'll touch on with questions. If not, I can, I can delve into those, but I feel compelled by looking at the clock to say what questions are out there. We have a lot of really, really good questions. So thank you for leaving ample time. Sure. All right, so I think we'll start with um, a question we have here about social media. Oh. Um, social media has given rise to citizen journalists. How should First Amendment rights be applied to citizen journalists? Well, I, I, it's a good question. I would just quibble a touch with the idea that social media started the rise of, of citizen journalism. Actually, citizen journalism, if you look at weeklies in this country, if you look at newsletters in this country, has been around for a long time. Uh, again, that, that's that idea that it does, you know, there was a quote from Mencken, um, who was a, a very um, satirist and bitter human being, I think, in a century ago, who, who said once, a free press belongs to the man, and would have been a man in those days, the man who owns one. Uh, well, no, it doesn't. It's belonged to all of us. Uh, so I, I think when we get away from this fascination with the national media in major cities, there's always been a robust um, citizen journalist uh, enterprise. But I get the tenor of your question. Uh, I would say citizen journalism actually was uh, amplified by the rise of the web per se. Uh, but social media has empowered all of us to be publishers, if you will. Uh, although social media companies deny that they're publishers, they see themselves simply as a conduit for information. Um, although Zuckerberg and Facebook has sort of altered his position to get a little more legal protection uh, because being a publisher implies certain things that they're not ready to do in, in Facebook. Um, but what, the way the law approaches, let me put it this way, it is that um, social media is, is not just protected by Section 230, which you've heard about, which provides a certain legal in, insulation for what is posted. Social media is the enterprise of, of private companies, not the government. Remember, the First Amendment only restrains government from censoring a free press. Social media companies have their own First Amendment rights. So when we use Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, you know, one of the zillions, WhatsApp, whatever it is. We're not operating under a system that we might if we were, say, a, a newspaper publisher or even the regulated mediums of broadcasters. It's a different regime in which that private company sets up something and says effectively to us, if you read through all the boilerplate that lawyers are paid to both write and ignore, um, I get to set the rules, and if you want to use my system, you get to follow them. And I could change the rules pretty much as I care to. Uh, and tough luck. I have my First Amendment rights. Uh, now, I'm being pejorative and glib, but that's essentially the posture. These companies have First Amendment rights. Now, let's go to the thrust of your question, um, which is when does that system not work or when should it be changed? 
Well, there are a couple of arguments about social media coming under the First Amendment as free press. Uh, one, strangely enough, would call them effectively a public utility. You know, we, we, again, often don't think about the fact that when electrical companies and water companies started or phone companies, um, they were private enterprises. And if you wanted you know, power from Gene's electric company in your town, you, I, you called me, I ran a line to your house, hooked it in, and that was between you and me. Well, we gradually obviously felt that those utilities that are now called public utilities were so important to our daily life that we could not sort of leave them to the whims of those private enterprises, uh, that they, you know, uh, poor areas would not be served because, or rural areas would not be served because it wasn't much profit, it cost a lot to run that line out to Farmer John's house 25 miles out of town, as opposed to Gene's place two blocks from the, you know, the electrical company. So we, we determined for the good of society to call them public utilities, privately owned, but regulated in some fashion by government, which sets certain standards of operation and limits and guardrails and all the rest. So some people would say social media, well, not really regulated as a free press enterprise, but simply is so essential to the way we talk today, that idea of conveying ideas that is fundamental to a free press, that they should be regulated that way. Other people simply say that by virtue of their operation, they have effectively become a public forum. And that's another way lawyers will say you can regulate certain things that they have essentially by their very function and mission and growth and impress, they have just taken themselves out into an area that they should be covered by the First Amendment, which ironically, since the founders saw the First Amendment as protection from government, that argument really says government's supposed to ride in on a horse and protect us. So it, it's a reversal of the way everybody from Milton and Arabogenica saw the role of government, which is going to present its own problems. Um, because uh, absent the independent judiciary, uh, the legislative and executive branches, as, as some scholars will want to say, you know, waft at the whims of public opinion. Uh, so you know, we get regulation this way and then regulation that way and something. Like that. A judiciary has, uh, as we've seen with Times v. Sullivan, you know, they're, they're still debating in the 1964 decision. I like that. I like slow law. Um, when it, particularly when it comes to my freedoms. I don't like people writing in real fast to restrain or restrict or even theoretically enlarge it, which I would never have. Um, so when we look at social media, we have to say right now, it's not a First Amendment issue. It's what a colleague of mine, Lada Knott, uh, who's a lawyer uh, now working in the voting rights area, uh, used to call First Amendment-ish. Uh, but it could become, and I, I talk about it now, the minute government moves in to intervene on whatever manner it does, I think the First Amendment becomes implicated and suddenly it becomes a First Amendment issue by default. But right now, um, I think what we should keep in mind is the concept of the marketplace of ideas and the idea that we protect a free press along with free speech uh, to allow this conveyance of ideas. You know, again, the function was not just to let us you know, openly grunt in public so that we could do that uh, or, or in print, it was to arrive uh, through public discussion unfettered by government with this marketplace of ideas principle to arrive at the best possible solution for the greatest number of people in what one hopes would be the shortest amount of time. Not perfect, not reach for perfection, but to constantly be reviewing and, and uh, providing a safety valve, providing a voice uh, that a free press does for um, those who would not perhaps otherwise be heard in our society. You know, if you, you go back to Alexis de Tocqueville, um, uh, French guy who traveled around the United States in the 1830s, I think, early 1800s, he warned about a few things in America. One of those things was what he called the tyranny of the majority, that uh, American tolerance of factionalism, breaking in, you hear some echoes today, of factions uh, would eventually, could eventually produce a permanent majority in which the minority not be heard. Part of the function of a free press is to give voice to those. What's the phrase? To afflict the comfortable and uh, comfort the afflicted. I think it's actually the other way. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Um, that's um, an old newspaper phrase. It's said in different ways, but uh, the Tocqueville would like, have liked that because what it said was essentially newspapers are there to never let us get too comfortable, to always remind us that there are those left outside of these decisions which of necessity benefit the majority because no decision is perfect. And no matter how small that minority is, they deserve to be heard. And a free press is one of those functions. And again, I'm not trying to 
talk around your direct question about social media and regulating it, but it raises so many profound implications about how a free press and freedom of speech function in this country. And I think we have to think that larger out of the box concept rather than just can I or, or some politician uh, post what we want on, you know, on a, on a Facebook chat or have a Facebook account. It, it really, these decisions we're going to make about social media are going to go to the very heart of why we have a free press and it is so protected, and why we have our own individual rights. Again, journalists have no more rights and no less than any of us. They just use them more often. Right. Uh, and we need to be very careful about that. So you know, just backing up a little bit to, to think about something you were saying was, you know, I guess my the first question is, I've got a question here from the, the audience that ties into a question that, two questions that I have. One, uh, does the press have any responsibility? The, the, the question from the audience is what should be the, right. you know, what should be the consequences to the free press when they don't live up to their responsibilities? And my question is, do they have a responsibility? Do we, do we ever define the press and do we give them a task that they must or must not do? And then the follow-up to that is, what's the difference between defamation and intentional disinformation? Remind me of that one because I want to get to the first one. The, the short answer about responsibilities to be completely blunt in law is no. I mean, your government cannot, it's a doctrine around enforced speech, and, but also uh, it just simply says, shall not abridge a free press. So it's the answer to that is, is, you know, that's it. That's sort of, that's it. As, as someone once said, well, we settled that in 1791 <laughs> or 1776. Um, now, obviously I think the market does. I mean, we all know about publications that have failed because they simply aren't relevant, don't serve a function, uh, are incredibly disingenuous, which gets toward that misinformation question, uh, but which we rely upon uh, what I call common sense which is if it's no good to me, why do I buy it? Why I support it? Right. If it doesn't perform its function. So I think that, again, the founders saw that as, as, a, as a check on freedom because they realized if government were to step into that equation, we would begin to see decisions not made on what I think is implicit in your question about responsibilities, whether they were good responsible functioners within society would be made on partisan or political issues or what have you, you know, revenge, whatever it could be. So the, you know, the honest answer is not not that there shouldn't be, because I believe there should be, but I also, it's just, there's no requirement. There's nothing about being nice or honest or professional. It sounds terrible, but if you really look at the law, that's the, that's the fact. Now, we have restraint. We have the right of defamation. And you and I, well, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm, I think by virtue of my career, I'm sort of a publicist. But if, if you're not, uh, you, you know, and somebody defames you by says, saying you're a criminal when you're not. Yeah, frankly, if they say I'm a criminal and not, I have a remedy, even as a public person, particularly if they knew that was not true. They just made it up. Or if they just didn't check. You know, I heard that around the bar, and so I said it out loud. That's, to me, reckless disregard. We're going to have to go to court and prove it. I'm going to have a higher bar than, than the ordinary folks, but, you know, I still got a shot at it. Um, I think what we're seeing in some ways, if we hadn't had the web, which we do, we would have seen a press that was beginning to see this sense of responsibility. Uh, after a period of the new toys of uh, broadcast, uh, we, you know, you begin to see it. You know, the, you remember the old, frankly, all too true image of the journalist who goes up to someone after a tragedy, usually a broadcast journalist, microphone, blaring lights, and goes, how do you feel about you know, some horrible moment? Um, you know, there was an era in which the folks who ran television thought that was a good idea, that was dramatic, it got eyeballs. But I will tell you that over time, that was fading, and fading fast, and is largely gone, although reporters still must ask awkward questions at awkward moments as part of their job. They have a responsibility to do that, but they ought to have a purpose. Um, my own experience. I worked at a newspaper in Indiana uh, early in the 70s that was printing in color. Um, staple of newspapers from the moment there were automobiles was covering automobile crashes. 
particularly in a small town, because you don't have issues of national security, you know, arising every day in a town of 30,000. You do have automobile crashes. We took a lot of those photos. And uh, we began to hear in the 70s, when his color crept into newspaper imagery, um, that what might have even been sort of moderately tolerable or whatever in black and white was not in color, thank you very much. And you began to watch that change. So again, the power of public opinion to shape that area of responsibility you're talking about from you know, huge issues to more mundane matters uh, was very real and remains so. Public opinion, the ability to be accepted in the marketplace. Um, now, you know, again, we're, we're going to talk about the difference between defamation and misinformation before I go to uh, defamation is if, if a successful defamation case is pressed, essentially what is found is deliberate harm was done for the wrong reasons to a person who must be made whole again. Remember, defamation law doesn't exist to punish the defamer. It exists to make the person defamed whole again. I lost my job and income for this amount of money determined either for a period of time or for my lifetime. And therefore, you defamer, you owe them that much money. Uh, sometimes it's correct that chapter in your book when it's reprinted. Uh, maybe it's pull the books back or pull the publication back, you know, but again, that's there. Misinformation has always been with us, of course, depending on your point of view. Sure. Uh, one could say it's misinformation or factual. Um, I think misinformation is in many ways more harmful, although we're also well prepared in the, because of the internet age, uh, but we've always had that misinformation aspect. Um, you know, we call it propaganda in earlier, more genteel time. Well, not genteel, maybe just innocent time. Uh, deliberate misinformation uh, and disinformation uh, have been tools of those who would tilt public debate, uh, try to cover up the facts. You know, uh, revered figures like Winston Churchill uh, once said, uh, history will be kind to me, comma, because I intend to write it. Um, which I think is, you know, <laughs> he's not really saying he's going to misinform, but he's clearly in charge of where the facts are going to be going, uh, in his view. And, and actually, that's largely true, or at least for many Churchillian uh, fans. Uh, but uh, defamation is that intentional uh, or harm through reckless disregard of an individual who, where they can be made whole. Mis and disinformation has so many more uh, impactful qualities, particularly, again, now in the age of instant mis and disinformation um, that you really have to say, um, I think we're ill prepared to deal with defamation, which is now instantaneous, pervasive and global and eternal. And the laws weren't really set up for that. So we're having to adjust in law for that. But we have only begun really to deal with mis and disinformation, which circles the world so quickly and becomes so pervasive mm -hmm. and takes place in an environment in which we increasingly do not have a multiplicity of sources by our own choice. Right. And one of the ironies of free press is we have access to more free press than ever anyone has in the history of mankind. And you find people who watch only one channel, one news source from which they get what they consider to be the view very often deliberately and identified as opinion, not even portrayed as fact. It's my opinion and my interpretation. But we choose to do that because it either makes us comfortable or it empowers us. And again, I, this marketplace of ideas is very much at war with this concept of this thought bubble or, or this uh, news environment in which we only get one, one perspective. Um, and it's made so much easy by what I call the magic lantern, by the screen that, uh, that, that gives us this, that we can either, we can, or an algorithm unknown to us and how it functions can sort it out for us uh, because that's a way to, you know, the more we read and we find those interesting pieces that agree with us or that they know by our choices makes it interesting, then advertisements come next to that. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, uh, to me, it's disinformation by, by this algorithmic emphasis on profit, uh, which is a whole new evening, but I would love to talk with you about that because <laughs> that's, that's another area of why we have to miss and diss. It's not even sometimes a deliberate attempt to shape public opinion. It's to you know, sell RVs or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so well, I have um, I have a follow up, actually okay. two follow ups that I think I'll combine into one okay. that does um, 
I think relate really nicely to, to what you were just saying. So freedom of the press is important in that it allows for the inclusion of all matter of opinions on any given subject. The problem seems to be that these views have never really been disseminated with equal force. How do you create a free press that gives equal amplitude to the multitude of ideas? And would you please mention any efforts on the part of the media to affect an even playing field such as such that one may be possible? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I've never looked at the answer to that question as a particular news outlet. I've always looked at it as a variety of outlets because um, you can, you can go with the idea that journalists are human beings and they have their own biases or whatever. You can look at institutions and, and news operations that exist just to service a particular point of view. Um, and again, the First Amendment protects that right. Um, and I like reading a good opinion that agrees with me. I'm like everybody else, why not? Uh, there have been some attempts through the years um, you know, that have been miserable failures to legislate that, for example, the fairness of it. Right. Which, first of all, was anything but, in my view. But because we own the airwaves, if you are a, a traditional broadcaster, print or, or I mean, a, a, a radio or TV, uh, this doctrine arose um, that uh, we're going to put certain conditions on broadcasters to present multiplicity of view. And it often rested in, uh, in the hands, uh, if, you, if you were honest about it, of, of a radio or television station general manager who by virtue of their life should never have been on radio or television because they were terrible at it. Reading an editorial or a position paper or moderating a debate uh, between the mayoral candidates, what have you. Uh, and the, the idea was you needed to present all the views. Well, uh, what happened is um, there were an impossibility really to present all views. So there was always the potential for being sued. Um, that those who were successful, um, say in conservative radio, which actually in the 1980s was the case, um, when the Fairness Doctrine had faded and it was talked about being back, it was conservative uh, host Rush Limbaugh once said he would go to the grave fighting the, the, this review of the Fairness Doctrine because he felt in a program which he carefully designed to present his point of view, um, it would force him to have others on there who, who disagreed with him and sort of interrupt his program and frankly, destroy the flow and, and the impact of what he was presenting. Um, what I think finally condemned, you know, sort of condemned the, uh, the fairness doctrine to a, first a slow death and then eventually um, being repealed was um, very smart lawyers said, you can't be sued for the thing you're not doing. So don't run those editorials. I am old enough to remember as a tiny child person um, when that station manager would get on at the end of the evening newscast and read an editorial. Well, if you didn't have your opinion presented, you didn't have a requirement to present anybody else's. And you did documentaries and things that would live up to a certain uh, uh, requirement to present uh, issues of importance. But it, it, it was not fair. It didn't produce fairness. It just produced this mishmash that failed. Um, you know, I, I think, um, again, the solution is not to say to every publication, you must be this, all voices. Um, because I think it's an impossibility to succeed. It is incumbent on us to have a multiplicity of sources. And again, that can be done so much more easily than in an era in which you might have had a certain number of newspapers delivered to your front door, or in most towns, one or two. You had two or three radio stations maybe affiliated with the networks at the time. I mean, today, what's the limit on news sources you can get out of your screen? I mean, there's really no limit. The problem is almost identifying the real ones now. So there's another issue, but you can still find multiplicity of voices with fair confidence in, the, in, the, in today's world. So I think the answer to that question is multiplicity rather than some imposition of government. You know, who's going to be the national nanny to say, oh, you didn't, you didn't present that second, third, fifth, eighth view, you know, bad boy, bad girl. No, multiplicity views. I will have a responsibility to get out of my comfort zone, my thought bubble, and find that multiplicity of voices that exists among a free press allowed to freely operate. And again, you know, I didn't have to have the government tell me, I almost didn't have to be taught that let's just say aliens invade um, the Empire State Building. That's the news report. Well, you know, if all three networks are live, I can see something in the building, 
spaceship hovering over it. Uh, there are major news operations reporting it. The Associated Press is reporting. That's a level of confidence and credibility. Multiplicity of sources. If the national hoo-hoo, whatever, Tatler and Corner, whatever reports it, you know, I don't need a government official to call me up and say, you know, that story in the national thing is not probably, you know, I've, I've learned over time who I can trust and not. Frankly, that exists on a lot of media as well. I have learned over time to go to sources, conservative and liberal, national and local, that I, I think are going to give me their view, perhaps, but certainly an accounting of facts that I can measure against them. Um, and that's the solution, I think, to the problem. Please don't create a national nanny who, who's, <laughs> who, who you know, has the book looking over the shoulder. It's not going to work, and it's going to be terrible. Our history just tells us that. All right, so I'm going to follow up on that before oh, I ask the next okay. question, which is, which is connected to that. So is there a business model for a media source, right? Because so many yeah. people out there are like, I, you know, I know we, I should go to this source and I should go to that source and I should read this editorial and I should read that. Nobody's got the time for that, right? So, so is there a business model where you put a multiplicity of views under one, you know, under one banner? Well, and has it ever yeah. been tried before? And does it have a prayer of succeeding in today's? Well, I'll age? be glib and I'll say, Welcome to Facebook, you know, so, but that, that again, is not really the answer. Um, and, 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 and the problem is the aggregators who would do that work for us are exactly part of the problem of killing off these enterprises because then I don't have to subscribe to them. Now, whether they should be required to pay for what they scrape off of, you know, there's a whole new regime. I think we're struggling for that model, frankly, right now in, as a country, uh, as a world in many ways, uh, and certainly in the news business to find that model um, some people suggest, uh, well, some people suggest government subsidies, which, <laughs> you know, I mean, what the government gives can take away. Uh, no less than Jerry Falwell once said, with the shekels come the shackles, yeah. as I recall. Um, so I, you know, okay. Now, you know, to be fair, there's always been a postal subsidy. Lower postal rates for printed matter sent through the mails, you know, so we, we sort of tiptoed into being a little bit pregnant, uh, so to speak. Um, but it was never such that it dominated the industry or controlled the flow of news and information. Um, it just made more money for people already making an incredible amount of money in that era. Um, so I, I think um, it, we're still searching for this. And, and my profound worry is frankly that we will lose a free press, functioning free press by default. That while we search for this model, more and more news print products certainly are going out of business. Local radio stations are sometimes closing down or becoming uh, even local newspapers as a shell. They have the name, the masthead, but the programming is being done in Houston or LA. And, you know, there are 22 clocks on the wall and local ads and makes it feel like this broadcaster is sitting in your community. And they're, they pre taped the show four days ago with a clock that told them what day and time it was. Um, and it has no connection to our, you know, the community. Um, so, I understand the necessity to do what you can do to stay in business now, but when you look at the decline of journalists with somewhere about newsroom population, somewhere in the 60s and 70 thousands of working journalists in the 90s and 80s, down to somewhere, some people would say under 20,000, I would say a touch over 20,000 today. Um, you look at the failing uh, aspect, of the, again, the news deserts, the death of week, well, the weeklies kind of doing better than daily, but, um, you know, I like a multiplicity of press. What do I do if there's no multiplicity? Right. Uh, you know, and so I think uh, uh, public broadcasting models, uh, you know, I am encouraged by uh, the irony of fading profits of news entities being returned to local ownership. Uh, you know, you just can't make enough money on them for the big moguls to want them anymore. Um, although, again, consolidation, uh, economies of scale, you know, one headquarters group, one advertising people, who, and central printing plants that you know, farm it out. That, that's going to stave off uh, some failure of, of local media. But you know, again, uh, one of the imponderables that I will tell you, again, it's not the dictator coming down the street, which is a problem in many countries. It could be here someday, perhaps. Um, the threat to a free press exists more with us and our willingness to support it, but also the ability of this enterprise to adapt to new technology. And, you know, I, we overcame um, 
the intrusion, if you will, of radio and then television. But it, it was nothing like what we saw with the rise of the web. You know, the only thing I can compare it to is Gutenberg, where I think there were probably a huge number of monks who were just incensed over this and put out of business. <laughs> uh, so that, that to me was the first technological revolution was suddenly these people who had been, you know, the only means by which we could I replicate mean, and print. Yeah, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're out of business. So uh, yeah. I talk, people talk about this being, the, you know, the first technological um, challenge to no, we, we've seen it before. Well, lest we go back to, to, the, to the business model of monks <laughs> scribing away, there's a question here that's a great, I think a great place to end, which is, mm -hmm. is, is journalism a promising career path for young people today? Well, depending on your goal. Make oodles of money? No. Um, enter a field in which um, you may lose friends and neighbors? Um, no. Uh, but that's always been the case. Um, I have been an optimist my entire life. I think the founders were optimists. Again, they created this pr tremendous protection for people who were called them horrible names because they were optimistic it was part of a process by which this country would thrive. They, and we would thrive because we would get, in a timely fashion, the relative degree of factual certainty tainted with opinion at times, uh, the news and information we needed to function as a, as a self-governing democracy. To me, I, again, I don't mean to be Pollyannish. I'm not, I hope. But I drop back to that. We need news and information. I am convinced with the number of creative people we're dealing with all kinds of issues afflicting the industry, which is not always economic. What about all those voices who have never been heard or represented in our newsroom? What about those audiences that have been traditionally ignored? Uh, what about the challenge of people who are no longer willing, as I was, to spend a long time working my way up the ladder, which were pretty much smart enough to run the entire shop today. Thank you very much. And technology lets you do that. Um, you know, I think it's still a tremendously creative field for those of you who would like to serve the public good, find tremendous satisfaction in telling people stuff that is so essential to our democracy. You know, so it, 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 in a, it's not public service in the way that a firefighter or police officer would be. But in some ways, I equate that. This, we talked about responsibility. Yeah. And I, I can be glib about it, but truthfully, I believe there is a responsibility incumbent on journalists to provide their fellow citizens with the news and information needed to self-govern. The system breaks down without that. Uh, a friend of mine named Ed Breen, who's still in his 80s, early 80s, hosts a radio show in the morning in a little town just north of where I am today, uh, did an interview with a mayor of a small town who's, who I, I find hope in this moment. He came on a show with Ed and the local radio station had just closed. And this town is about 15 miles away, 20 miles away from where Ed worked. And he said, how do I talk to my constituents? They don't go to the government website and we're not equipped to portray the information about us and to hold ourselves accountable in the way that those news people do. And we need that in our democracy. I need to know when I'm not doing what people want. How do I find it? People don't want to answer survey. You know, he went on and on. It was a, a huge statement by somebody you might have expected to be a, an opponent of media to say we need that check and balance system, that outside view, that a conduit for citizens to react to us that isn't a function of government. It's asking too much of us to operate that at the same time we're doing to operate that checks and balances system over on the side and do it in a way that isn't tainted with partisanship. So if you're interested in becoming part of that constitutional process, that says whether or not your town council should approve repairs to the local pool, let alone whether we ought to recognize nations or how do we deal with China or national economic issues. It's a great field to get into. Um, so I I'm, I'm remain optimistic that we will find solutions. There's a lot of creative people out there. This thing that we have, the web, which was so disruptive, uh, can also be a great tool for creativity. And it reaches into everybody's home. We know that. You know, everybody's carrying around a little device. Right. Um, that we can speak to them instantly. We can speak to the planet. Think about it. If you're a journalist today, you can speak to essentially 
capability of Almost. every living soul on the planet. Never before has there been a generation of journalists with that power in their hands. So if you're power it's hungry, point. it's a great job. It's a great point. Emily's got one more for you. Yeah, Emily. I do. I have one more to squeeze in before our time is up, and it, it is related. Okay, so the question is, if you could recommend a single oh. news story, either written or something that was broadcast, what would you recommend for everyone to read as, a, as an example of truly excellent journalism? Of course, I'll go blank on a story that everybody could see, but I would ask that over the next week, look at a variety of sources and find one where we have, fi have found someone who held government or some member of our society, some element of our society accountable for doing damage to people that would not otherwise have been known except for that journalist. I can think of examples in the past. Um, there's one that I, I will tell you touched me because I know a, a number of people who served in the military. I worked with um, the military on their journalism for about 30 some years. When we were first in the Middle East in war, you remember Humvees that looked like big Jeeps on steroids, you know, somebody watered them and they grew and they were great. Except when people began to plant explosives in the roads, the improvised explosive device IEDs, because they had a flat bottom, the blast would come up, would tear up the bottom of the, of the Humvee where people were sitting with legs exposed and cause terrible injuries, deaths and injuries, maiming. The military designed a vehicle called an MRAP, which was a resistant vehicle that had a, a V-shaped hull so that the blast would come up. It still you know, could be horrible, but it deflected a lot of the blast and out. And they began to manufacture these in great numbers. It was a journalist from USA Today who found, again, no villains here, that the people manufacturing these were churning them out. The people in charge of getting them out to the war theater were also charged with efficiency. You know, don't send ships out there with a few dozen or whatever. So they would pile up in ports until there was a sufficient number to be delivered. And, you know, they weren't evil people. There was no villain here. These people, they're moving vast amounts of equipment. This is one piece of the, you know, the pie. What happened was when the survival rates became apparent and the, and the people on the ground in the military were saying, we need these, we need these. Well, you know, Pentagon's a big place, big bureaucracy. That journalist was able to pierce through all that bureaucracy by writing stories about the lives that would be saved. Secretary of Defense saw this report in USA Today, which again, my old newspaper. They basically said, forgive me, screw the efficiency, get these things over there. And thousands of these vehicles were delivered where they saved lives, tens of thousands of lives. The military's own assessment was that they, again, no villains here, but a disconnect in government. You know, that is a story relied on facts, certainly was an opinionated, you know, get these damn things off the ports and into the hands of people who can use them. But it was the kind of accountability that I think the founders had in mind. And again, it didn't require anybody to go to jail. It didn't require anybody with an evil intent, you know, it was simply somebody outside the system, but with knowledge of it, a journalist, to make something good happen. Right. So, you know, and, and you could find that down the line on small, so-called small stories. You could find it on, you know, where there is corruption and graft, frankly. Um, you know, and those stories, I will challenge you over the next week to say, if you enlarge your reading, that you don't find a number of those stories, not just one. And I would challenge those people listening tonight. And uh, you can reach me through the First Amendment Museum. Tell me I'm full of beans in a week. Okay, but I'm, that's not going to happen. You're going to find those stories. And you're also going to find stories about things that are working well, which I think if you're talking about responsibility, we also have a duty as journalists to say, you know what? That program to provide housing for people who did, it works or it's being tweaked to make it even better, but it basically got people off the street and into a house. What's wrong with that? That's a great story. Not happy talk news, not glossing things over, but it works. So I think you'll find those stories prevalent if you look for them. What's happened today is we're so caught up in, frankly, what is often a national debate over a handful of people in the White House press corps or whatever, 
and political combines, and we confuse, program for another evening, we confuse the pundits and opinion people who are not journalists on cable TV, uh, but who are there to, under freedom of the press to provide their own opinion. Um, we, we, we obscure the 20,000 people still working. You know, I, I'd much, yeah. I think there are so many people tell us whether our kids' school lunch is safe or not. Um, and you know, that's not a national security issue, but you know what, if I've got a kid going to eat lunch at the school, I want to know if it's good or not. Yeah. And if it's going to harm them. And that's the story most journalists write today. They live in your town. They go and shop in the same stores, worship at the same churches. A free press is fundamentally a local press to me. And, and that gets lost in this big debate and kerfuffle over, you know, even, even Facebook and all that. We got to talk about it. But we got to remember what is what a journalist really do that's much truer the way I think the founders saw free press function. Right. Well, Gene, thanks so much for being with us tonight. It's always a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And I apologize to those folks we didn't get to their questions if there were any uh, that we didn't. Well, you've given us, you know, eight new subjects to host uh, <laughs> talk, talks on. So we'll we'll be lining those up. The Eternal um, Series. That's right. That's right. It's like the First Amendment. There's just so many rabbit holes right. we can go down. That's right. Absolutely. So everybody who's out there on behalf of James Madison's Montpelier and the Center for Civic Education and the First Amendment Museum, thank you so much for tuning in. Join us next Tuesday night for the Freedom of Assembly with Chelsea Miller, the co-founder of Freedom March, New York City. Should be great. Thank you all. Have a great night. Have a great week.